you expect revenues to double in a fairly short amount of time. Why? Uh, because it's the, the pieces have come together. You know, there are no shortcuts in healthcare. You really have to do the groundwork. Over the last 11 years, we've been doing the groundwork. Largely, the clinical investigation, the clinical data, we have over 425 peer-reviewed publications. We've gone through the necessary regulatory steps. We then go to the payers, Medicare, and the commercial insurance companies. Most importantly, though, we have the data to confirm we have a better patient outcome, a better patient experience, and we reduce the total cost of care for the patient and for society. So who's the most important audience here, then? Is it the, is it the care provider? Is it the insurance company? I mean, it's interesting to listen to you talk about how much you have to prepare the market for so many years. But, yeah. you know, ultimately, at the point of care, where does, where's the real decision made, and who is it you got to pitch? So you said, who's the, who's the pitch? It's yes. It is the patient, first of all, then the physician who cares for the patient. But ultimately, it's the provider, the hospital systems, the care price, and the insurance companies. We have to have every stakeholder aligned to make this work. It's why there are no shortcuts, why it's taken 11 years, and over four, $500 million to date to get us here. Right. But, but one of the things that we loved about HeartFlow is that they do more for less. And if we think about the last 20 years of medical innovation, there's been some great breakthroughs, but they're very expensive, right? So it's more care for more dollars, right? The promise of HeartFlow is that not only is it a breakthrough in terms of its efficacy, but it lowers the total systemic cost of care because it eliminates unnecessary invasive procedures, and even more importantly to patients, it eliminates uh, 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 tragic events and catastrophic events. And so, uh, what, one thing that attracted you know uh, us to the company is uh, you know uh, uh, aligning with the payers who can save total system costs for themselves uh, because everybody wins. The payers can win, the doctor can win, the provider can win, and we obviously naturally believe investors can win alongside of them. Right. Um, well, this is your second SPAC deal. Obviously, Butterfly was your first. We had yes. you on some time back with Jonathan Rothberg. Um, in this one, interestingly, you're returning some capital. And I, I, I just wanted to mention that briefly because it's something we have not really seen too often. Mm -hmm. why, why not give them as much capital as available in your SPAC? Uh, uh, the, the company and its board, um, we're very committed to have the company be fully capitalized, um, which includes $200 million to invest in the company for its growth plan to the time in which, in late 24, they become free cash flow positive, and then also to have a $200 million cushion just in case, as well as for accelerated internal investments or perhaps some bolt-on investments. But the company also believes that, that their equity is extremely valuable, and quite honestly, they didn't want to sell a dollar more. It would have been to our best advantage as a SPAC sponsor to try to convince them to take as much capital as possible, right? Uh, but we respect the, the uh, uh, culture of the company, uh, which is to minimize dilution. Uh, uh, the most bullish people about the, the, the company's uh, future are actually the long-term investors who've been with the company, as well as the long-term employees. The executive team here has been together on average seven years. So this is a, uh, a well-seasoned group coming public, even though they're a new public company. Uh, it's a very mature organization as they come public. Right. Uh, and as for SPACs overall, Larry, this, as I said, is your second. But your main job still is to run a long, short equity portfolio. That is. Or is it? I mean, I wonder, how do you view SPACs as somebody now who's got a couple of them mm -hmm. in the marketplace? One, obviously, is already de -SPAC. Uh, is it an adjunct, or is it, does it become a more significant uh, focus for you, given the potential profitability and the level of control that you may have that obviously is not usually available at large public companies? Well, uh, for us, it's an adjunct uh, uh, activity. From the perspective of at Glenview, we are always looking for those 20 special investments that can carry forward our investors' returns uh, and, and tax efficiently over the long term. As you know, we've held over 75 companies for five years or longer, so we are not traders, we are investors. Uh, the SPAC business has allowed us a unique opportunity to be able to create those high-quality investments, to be able to partner with uh, executives like John and Charlie Taylor and the, the, the team at HeartFlow and the board to create the culture right the first time, to go out and attack the problem, to be able to, to uh, uh, aggressively invest in growing the company uh, for the long term. And so for us, uh, our SPAC activities accelerate what we're trying to do at Glenview. Finally, as you know, I'm a valuation sensitive investor. So we've always struggled with how do we deal with high valuations versus our desire to back the most emerging technologies. Uh, the SPAC market does allow our investors to be able to pre-negotiate a price for a high growth company that we find to be highly attractive. In the case of HeartFlow, it is being brought at a 27% discount to the, the high growth comparables 
sales on 23 revenues and a bigger one as they grow faster. But there's a lot of execution to do in order to, to earn into the multiples, and we will now turn our attention to helping the company execute. Shepard Smith here. Thanks for watching CNBC on YouTube.